Hey, True Believers England team here for another Comic Geek News episode. In this one, we're going to be talking about an article where the Russos explain what they plan to do about Captain Marvel in Avengers Endgame. This is a long one, so if I have time, I've got a story about Brian Michael Bendis taking on DC's villains, as well as, well, a movie that it seems like I like and nobody else does. Once again, all of that is time permitting. I like to keep these things around between 10 and 12 minutes, so we'll see. The first article, though, is Russo's on Avengers Endgame Captain Marvel Concerns. Marvel Studios and Kevin Feige are taking a big gamble on Brie Larson and Captain Marvel as they are retconning the character into the MCU and are essentially forcing the character onto fans, which is what failed the, with the Disney Star Wars. It's good to see somebody else acknowledge this you know i mean they're they're saying hey you know this is the character that everybody's gonna love without giving us anything to actually love and at least this article right here is acknowledging that to boot the mcu version of captain marvel doesn't seem at all like the comic book counterpart which has never been a big seller as comics has gone through dozens of relaunches Already, the MCU version of Captain Marvel is being described as the MCU's most powerful character. It's been said the character is responsible for Samuel L. Jackson forming the Avengers in the first place. It's th thought she is becoming the new leader of the Avengers, and Feige has gone on record stating that Captain Marvel will be the new face of the MCU, and the movie hasn't even been out yet, and she was never a part of the previous 10 years of Marvel movies. Honestly, if we're talking natural progression, we're looking at Chadwick Boseman. Black Panther, obviously, he's the most popular. He's basically Iron Man in a different suit. Or Thor or somebody. Somebody who's proved their popularity with the, uh, with the movie going public. That's what happened with Iron Man. Here we have Brie Larson as Captain Marvel trying to do the whole Evita thing on the balcony singing You Must Love Me. It just doesn't make sense. So to say there is cause for concern is an understatement. It doesn't help that Brie Larson, don't say hi to her in an airport, is promoting the character as a feminist superhero. So where does that leave the rest of the 99.9% .9 of the fans? Again, this is all similar to what Kathleen Kennedy and Disney did with the Star Wars franchise. I'm, I'm editing as I go. Especially Star Wars The Last Jedi, which div divided the fan base. Never a good thing and caused the Star Wars movies to be slowed down and some canceled at Disney. Following the April release of Captain Marvel, will the MCU share the same fate? It's a possibility. If you go by the comment section on my videos, I would have to say that's a very, very strong possibility. A lot of people are just saying flat out, the end game is exactly that. It's the end game. Especially after hearing the future is female, not just for... Um, not just for Star Wars, but for the MCU. Now, I'm not, I don't mind if the future is female so long as the movies are good and the stories are promoted as stories. Go right on ahead. It's the hero crap. You know, Wonder Woman, great freaking flick. I love that movie. And we didn't have this kind of promotion. It was like, hey, look, we made a good movie. You should go see this good movie. And you know what people did? They went and saw that good movie. And you know what? It was. Uh, it was. It did. It showed exactly what Captain Marvel is announcing that it is. It was a strong female character, something that women could be behind and, and proud of, and such. So, yeah, it's it's a lot of the marketing, in my opinion, anyway. And of course, what I see in the comment sections. Another concern is that following the Avengers Endgame, the Russo brothers may not be involved with Marvel. It's the Russo brothers who put out the best MCU movies, as they are a huge fan of the comics. Something Feige can't say. He's a movie buff. Uh, let's see, and then they just go into a bunch of personal stuff. Uh, well, the Russo's gone for Marvel, and with the launch of Captain Marvel, I'm dreading to think what Feige is going to do with the MCU. Cosmic fans, just look at Guns, Guardians of the Galaxy, and Taiki's Taiki Watiti Thor Ragnarok is entertaining movies, but awful adaptions of their stellar comic book storylines. I agree with that statement about Thor Ragnarok. However, I find myself liking the movie version of Guardians of the Galaxy than anything I ever read in the comic books. So with all the cause for concern about Cap Marvel, the good news, at least for the Avengers Endgame, is that Joe and Anthony Russo are well aware of the potential problems with Carol already said to be the 
universe's most powerful character. A lot of fans are expecting her to take down Thanos in one punch. The Russos address the potential OP issue while speaking with Cinema Blend. It's always a concern of ours about overpowering characters because the reason people relate to these characters is their humanity and that are, that they're flawed. And the reason we love working so much with Captain America was that he was limited and his heart was his superpower. Well, that and the super strength, super speed, so forth, so on. Uh, so we're acu- acutely aware of the dangers of having an overly powerful character, but we like sensitive storytelling, so we found a thoughtful way through it. While they couldn't go into specifics, the good news is that apparently they have Captain Marvel figured out for the Avengers Endgame. That's what kind of fires us up, I think, on a storytelling level, to be honest with you. Because when you do have powerful characters, you have to work that much harder to find their vulnerabilities and complexities. And Joe was mentioning on a storytelling level and keep the stakes high. Because that's where those characters are vulnerable. And actually, that makes for great drama, and you run in that direction. As storytellers, that's been one of the most fun things we've had working with these characters, is figuring out ways into them where they are vulnerable and they aren't all-powerful. So there you go. I guess they got a handle on it, for in-game at least. They say they found humanity in Captain Marvel. I'm thinking... If they did, could they draw a map for the creators of the Captain Marvel movie? Because so far from the trailers, I haven't seen it. For our next story, we're going to talk about how the year of the villain will infect the DC Universe. Dan Didio, co-publisher of DC Comics, has said regarding the year of the villain at DC Comics, add any hyperbole that you like, but this will be the driving force of the DCU in 2019. Uh, DC Year of the Villain begins as a 25-cent comic out in May by Scott Snyder, James the IV, and Brian Michael Bendis with art by Alex Maliv, Jim Chung, and Francis Manipul with a cover by Greg Capullo. Are you telling me we're going to get comic books where superheroes fight supervillains and not other superheroes in 2010s? Get out of here. The Bendis Maliv story probably kicks off the series that Bendis talks about here. And see, the Justice League fights Lex Luthor's Legion of Doom with the imprisoned goddess Perpetua on their side. Running through 2019, Superman will fight Uber Crime Empire Leviathan, Batman will face City of Bane, made up of his rogues gallery, and we'll get a new Batman Who Laughs comic. That sounds good to me, except for the part where Brian Michael Bendis is writing. Get rid of that part, and I think we are talking a winning formula here. But what Bleeding Cool now hears is something a little like Marvel's Where's Wolverine pages appearing in comic books before the official return of that character, with a series of two pages prelude to the Year of the Villain written by Scott Snyder and Brian Bendis. Also with a side effect of getting these three talent draws onto the names of as many DC Comics titles as they can, those that are still being published, of course, and showing how the title in question will tie in with the whole Year of the Villain thing. Look, I'm on board. Uh, I like DC villains. I'm very much wanting to find out where they go with them, so long as it's more Snyder-influenced than Bendis-influenced. Because otherwise, with Bendis, you know what you're going to get. Well, we're going to deconstruct them. What you think you know about the DC supervillains is wrong, and we're going to bring you all new secrets. And yeah, okay, we've heard it before. So yeah, I'm not very much looking forward to seeing what Brian Michael Bendis can do with them, but hopefully Snyder will be steering the ship. I found this article, Avatar, Why Nobody Cares About the Highest Grossing Movie of All Time. And this is after I made the announcement a couple of days ago about how I like the Avatar movie. I don't see why why all the hate. I know, ooh, I liked it better when it was... And then they mention whatever. Some people mention Pocahontas, but no. No, this is more Dances with Wolves to me. But uh, yeah, it's still pretty good, and it does some pretty good world building as well. Anyway, figure let's jump into this thing. In December of 2009, James Cameron Avatar was released in theaters, quickly gaining critically acclaimed and smashing records at the box office. The movie did so well, it still stands as the highest grossing film of all time, beating out previous champions and other hit Cameron film, Titanic. Sequels were quickly planned, and in 2017, a Pandora-themed area in Walt Disney World's Animal Kingdom opened to the public. Suffice to say, Avatar has blown up into a massive franchise. Or has it? 
Okay, just a heads up, what you're seeing here, I filmed with my cell phone when I first started Mad About the Mouse, my Disney channel. I figure, okay, I have some Pandora footage, why don't I put that here? I have to go out and get better, now that I've got a better camera. Uh, so, anyway... I am amazed at how much backlash it's got. Now, granted, I understand. It was, it made it because at the time, 3D just hit, and it is a marvel to look at in 3D on the big screen. When you bring it home, you could start seeing the flaws a lot better. and It's a lot easier to, to focus on the story and realize, yeah, we have seen this in Fern Gully and, uh, and Dances, with Wol was, blah, 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 Dances with Wolves. So I, I completely understand that there's some backlash, but it's still a very fun, entertaining movie that does a lot of world building. So, yeah, I just don't understand it. Um, anyway, let's continue. Despite Avatar maintaining its hold on the title of highest grossing film of all time and being nominated for a Best Picture Oscar, there's not really all that much love for it. Rather, there was love for the first film, but within a year after its release, the hype died down. Why is this exactly? Well, a few things have contributed to the collective apathy towards the franchise, leading it to become the blue skin butt of film industry jokes. I think my previous comment kind of covers this particular thing, so I'm just going to continue with the article. No one can say Avatar wasn't a success. It's a little cheesy, a little predictable, and a little too reliant on the latest special effects, but overall, it's a typical, well-crafted James Cameron movie that captured audiences with the same thrill as the premiere of A New Hope. Perhaps the best way to describe Avatar is that it's a movie movie. The type of film that isn't perfect, but ex expertly does its job of taking you away into another world for a few hours. And frankly, yeah, I, I could kind of see that and I can kind of enjoy it. Look, it, it's got a message. It's, it's uh, an environmental message in this one. But even though then it's kind of heavy-handed, it still doesn't feel as oppressive as movies today that decide to put their messages before the story. And I think that's the main thing. Even though there was a heavy-handed environmental message in it, it didn't overpower the story. And so, yeah, once again, I had fun with it. Maybe go back and check it out again compared to movies today. <laughs> it, is, it is a little bit more fun. And, of course, having said that, it's back to the article. Going back to comparisons to Star Wars, this actually helps us uh, to understand where Avatar went wrong. Avatar definitely hit audiences and critics with the same power as the first Star Wars film. And in many ways, that appeared to be the goal, to make a new Star Wars. In fact, before the film became a hit, Cameron stated that he wanted to make sequels. If Avatar was a success, making clear that the director-creator's ambitions to reach the same heights as other franchise, uh, perhaps even to become the next Star Wars. Okay, well, I watched the uh, movie and I heard about this. I do remember him saying that, or at least reading it anyway. But I never got the feeling that he had written a large script that could be split up into a couple of movies or even became an outline for future movies. It was just that, hey, I had fun doing this. I think I will do the next one or the next one. So I was thinking, you know, four years maybe before we got another sequel. And continuing with the article or striking when the iron is cold. Continuing with the Star Wars comparison, after the success of A New Hope, it was only three years before Empire Strikes Back was released. An exceptionally fast sequel turnaround for the time period. Now, look at Avatar. The first film came out in 2009, and within a year or two, two sequels were planned, announced, and greenlit, with two more sequels be being confirmed in 2016. However, despite it being a clear that a franchise was going to be built up uh, upon Avatar, the first two sequels didn't start filming until 2017, a full eight years after the release of the first movie. Very early on, it was revealed that the sequels were going to focus on underwater aliens of Pandora, with Cameron stating that the reason for the delay was due to the current, at the time, motion capturing technology being inadequate for underwater filming. And of course, this is a thing. James Cameron is a very visual director. He's going to want the best of the best, and he's done this before. He waits for technology to be there. This is not a huge surprise that he would do this. And so, the article continues. Regardless of whether 
This was the only factor delaying production. The fact remains that Avatar 2, which is set to premiere in 2020, a full 11 years after the original, is coming far too late to ride on the massive success of the first film. If Cameron and 21st Century Fox wanted to strike while the Avatar iron was hot, they missed their opportunity by at least seven years. Honestly, yes and no. I think there's a huge interest in Avatar, and the reason why I think there is is because of the lines and the crowds in Pandora. It is consistently busy. As a matter of fact, you may actually go to Animal Kingdom and have a less busy day if you stay away from Pandora. That is constantly packed. Back to the article at hand. Another major problem with the Avatar franchise is that it, in many ways, acts as though it's already a multi-film franchise. Take a look at Pandora, the World of Avatar, 12-acre Avatar-themed land in Disney World's Animal Kingdom. As beautiful and well done as the area is, it's no doubt a major accomplishment in Imagineering. Oh, hell yes it is. It was a rather poor choice to adapt Avatar into a theme park land. One would think, seriously, I said it, make Beastly Kingdom mythological creatures are constant. I mean, you know, they're timeless. You can do them anytime. Nobody's giving a crap about Avatar anymore, I said way back then. And then, like a year later, went to ride on flights of passage only to see that the wait was four hours long. And people are happy to wait in there. Do you know why? They are freaking awesome. And yes, the, uh, the, the floating mountains and everything look amazing. It is just absolutely amazing. And all around, you have interactive parts of the park as well, so... Yeah, you could say that it was a bad idea, but the crowds just don't agree with you. Alrighty, back to what they have to say in the article. Talks of developing an Avatar-themed attraction began in 2011, many years before the upcoming Disney-Fox merger was planned. And though this could have been considered a prime period to cash in on the success of the film, Pandora didn't begin construction until 2014. Still, this isn't so long after Avatar's release that the land wouldn't be profitable, but it didn't open to the public until 2017, running into the same problem as the upcoming sequels. Interest was lost, and there wasn't exactly a fandom surrounding the property. Horse shit. <laughs> I'm not lying about right now. This is what, two years after it opened? Two freaking years. You will still wait if you go during a busy period for four hours for flights of passage, sometimes more. Navi River Journey, which by the way is one of the worst rides Disney has made because what the fuck is it all about? They ran out of budget and they should have just said, you know what, let's go over budget and prepare the ride like it's supposed to be. But it's like, what the hell did I just ride? You wait in an hour, and, and but still, people will wait for that hour to see that ride. It's amazing how people really love this land. So yeah, the, the person who wrote this is full of crap. Anyway, back to the uh, article. And that right there is one of the biggest issues with the Avatar franchise, the lack of fandom. Avatar has produced merchandise, books, comics, and Cirque du Soleil show in a Disney World park before even releasing its second film, affecting putting the franchise cart before the fandom horse. In other words, Avatar has attempted to form a fandom with the release of tie-in material without ever having earned that fandom by releasing more content to follow up the original film. The planning and opening of a Disney park area coming before a second movie had even begun filming is a prime example of this backwards approach. Yeah, Disney can't hear you over them counting their money on how many people are going to go to Avatar Land. I, I, I agree with you on paper, it shouldn't have worked. But holy Toledo, it did. Anyway... Uh, back to their article, Disney and the Future of Avatar. One of the strangest parts of Animal Kingdom's Pandora is that the deal leading to its creation predates the plans for Disney ac accusation, acquisition excuse me, of Fox's entertainment properties, at least as far as we know. This is to say that Disney trusted the sequels would take off before it had plans to buy it, though perhaps the franchise, along with the X-Men movie rights, were part of what motivated the bid for Fox's properties to begin with. Could very well be... I Me, mean, you know, they have their interests. I don't know. Anyway, uh, back to the article. Disney trusted the sequels would take off before it had planned. Okay, I already read that part. Regardless, as little as people might care about Avatar, Disney is likely to make it a hit. 
I'm pretty damn sure they will. James Cameron will make it a hit. If it was still in Fox, it would be a hit. In fact, the studio more or less has to in order to make Pandora worth the investment. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, come to Animal Kingdom and check out their freaking investment. After all, if the deal with Fox goes through, Avatar 2 will release after the franchise becomes part of Walt Disney World's company. Suffice to say, despite Avatar hype quickly dying down within a year of the first film's release, there's no doubt Disney will do its best to take it to the heights initially set out to reach. And I'm pretty sure it will. This is the way it works with James Cameron. He makes a movie. Everybody goes, oh, it's good, it's good, it's good. Oh, I don't like that shit. Oh, that's horrible. It's bad. I don't like it. Oh, there's a new James Cameron movie. Well, let's make it the new biggest film of all time. That's the way it is. It's his magic. It's what James Cameron does. And he will do it again with Avatar 2. Absolutely. You could say, well, I'm not going to see. Yeah, you're going to see it because it will be a technological marvel. It will be something that will be made to see on the big screen. And you're going to go see it. I mean, we can all say it, but the truth is, is yes, you will. And as far as their, oh, well, they need to return on their investment. Dude, I'm telling you, that place is packed constantly. So what this is right here is a part of the ride where you have to wave your hands and it will make, uh, that's what I'm reading. I'm reading the sign. You wave your hands and then these guys kind of come to life and they start spreading wa or spraying water. I've got an umbrella because they told me it was going to rain. And it's always good to have an umbrella in the summertime for, for Disney anyway. So it starts going and, okay, there you go. All right, so what we do next, and then it starts spraying water everywhere. But what you don't know is that actually by doing this, you're spraying the crowd off to the side there. And I thought, oops, I didn't mean to get you guys wet. Sorry. And then I did it again. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. And there's that kind of stuff all over the Disneyland. And people are enjoying the hell out of it. And they're coming in droves to the point where, yes, they wait four hours for a ride. So as far as Avatar is concerned, like I said, I enjoy the film. I don't think it's the best film ever made. It's a beautiful film to look at. The ride, by the way, Fly Flight to Pandora is absolutely the best ride in Orlando. And that's saying something because we know how to build a ride over here. Uh, but yeah, dudes, as far as Avatar's the sequels, I'm in. I'm absolutely in, and there's the wait sign just to prove what I was saying. Anywho, uh, that's the news, and I am out of here. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below. I know I'm the only one that cares about Avatar. That's why I like this uh, this little article here, because <laughs> it, it was basically, wait a second, yeah, because uh, I had just mentioned it. I thought it was funny that I found it right after I mentioned it. Um, so let me know what you think in the comments below. Also, click like, share, subscribe, hit that notification bell. If you do like this video, there's going to be cards pop popping up here uh, leading to other Comic Geek News videos. So check those out. They're a lot of fun. Don't forget to go over to Patreon and to Ko-Fi. Drop a dollar in the till and help us keep the lights on and help us keep making videos for you. Like, thank everybody who's already done that. And to everyone, all of the true believers, thank you very, very much for watching.